The next step was to show um, in vitro that this hypothesis held up, not just in the screen, and, but, but in a panel of different cell lines. And so what I'm showing here is data for three different cell lines, um, which as you can see express different levels of the insulin-like growth factor one receptor. And what was noted was that when you treat with an mTOR inhibitor, that as expected, you can block very nicely um, phospho-S6 kinase downstream of mTOR. Um, and, but what you also noted was that there seemed to be a feedback mechanism when you treated with an mTOR inhibitor that you actually saw induction of AKT, phospho-AKT. So there's a feedback loop that seems to be occurring when you in, treat with a rapalog that inhibits the TORP1 complex. But what was noted here was that when we added the, M, the IGF-1R inhibitor to treatment with the mTOR inhibitor, that you saw, you, you saw um, inhibition of that signal, that phospho-AKT signal, as well as the phospho-S6 kinase, suggesting that you're able to inhibit both of those signaling pathways um, much more than with either agent alone. Now, what we like to say often is that if you, you see an effect in one cell line, that's like seeing an effect in one patient. And if you have an effect in one patient, you don't have a drug. What you want to see this is in large panels of cell lines, and also to give you a better sense of which patient populations you might want to be treating. So what I'm showing you here is data on the combination in a panel of 67 different breast cancer cell lines. And so um, the cell lines are shown here, obviously much too small for you to read. Um, but what you can look at is the, um, the gene expression profiling, and in particular of the estrogen receptor, which as most people know in breast cancer really drives the expression of many genes. And you can see these cell, they, they tend to block into those that are ER positive and those that are uh, ER negative. And what I'm showing here in these little black bars are the ability of either mTOR inhibitor alone, IGF-1R inhibitor alone, or the combination of the mTOR inhibitor plus the IGF-1R inhibitor to inhibit the cell growth. And so what you'll see is if you have a large black bar like this one here, it suggests that the agents in combination are doing absolutely nothing. It shows that if you see absolutely nothing there, it suggests that in this case, for instance, the IGF-1R inhibitor alone is completely blocking the growth of that particular cell line. And what was noted was when we looked at the combination of these two agents in the 67 breast cancer cell lines that you saw the most activity in this set of ER positive cell lines. Not only those that were ER positive, but those that also had a high proliferation index, the so-called luminal B subset of breast cancer. So the next thing we wanted to do is take this in vitro results in vivo. And here shows results for just one model. This happens to be a lung cancer xenograft um, that was tested. And you can see when we use the mTOR inhibitor in red here, the IGF-1R inhibitor in blue, you see some activity relative to the untreated control. But you see the combination of the two actually shows regressions, and, 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 uh, rather than just slowing of the growth of those tumors. And it does so in a dose-dependent manner, as shown over here. So when we add greater. Uh, amounts of the IGF-1R inhibitor, first of all at 0.2 mg per kg, 2 or 20 mg per kg, you see really frank regressions, in a, again, in a dose-dependent manner. So we have both in vitro evidence and in vivo evidence that the combination could be active, particularly in a subset of breast cancer, but also as I showed you in lung cancer models as well. And so this slide then um, summarizes what we believe is going on, at least one hypothesis that the treatment of, with an mTOR inhibitor of signaling downstream, a particular of cell lines that express the IGF-1R receptor, is that there's a feedback pathway that, that, that um, affects the signaling downstream of the IGF-1R receptor, that use of an IGF-1R inhibitor will block that, back, that feedback mechanism and have a, better, a more direct effect on signaling in these cell lines and then cell growth. So that's the preclinical data we had back in um, uh, late 2008. And so a, a clinical trial was actually opened uh, in late 2008, looking at the combination of the IGF-1R inhibitor with the mTOR inhibitor. Now, for those of you who don't know, phase one trials are, are the first trials where drugs are tested in patients, um, usually in highly refractory patients who um, don't respond to standard agents that are available to them. And so what you're uh, looking for is obviously safety of these agents together, but also some preliminary activity. 
Um, and so this combination was tested. We enriched for breast cancer patients based on the preclinical data we had. But we also wanted to ask whether other patients in other histologies might also be responsive to this combination. And we also were um, uh, very good about uh, examining biopsies from these patients to look at various biomarkers that I've already pointed out might be important in uh, selecting patients who would be most likely to respond to this combination. So here's the results, um, data from which was just presented last Saturday at ASCO. Um, and this is showing the data from a subset of the breast cancer patients. So overall, there were 23 breast cancer patients who were enrolled in this phase 1b study. And 10 of those 23 patients actually had some activity, anti-tumor activity, either partial responses based on resist criteria, or prolonged survival, or various tumor markers being knocked down very significantly. What was really exciting was the fact that not only do we see this sort of activity, which, by the way, typically in a study like this, you get excited if you see 10% response rates. When you see 10 out of 23, you start to get more excited. And what we found was that if you looked actually in those subset of patients that are ER positive and had the high proliferation index, that over 50% of those patients responded. So that certainly got our attention and I think quite a few people's attention. And interestingly, if you look at the subset of patients that were ER positive but actually had a low proliferation index, zero out of five of those patients had a response. This next slide shows one, the data from one of those patients um, treated with the combination. This is sort of pre-treatment. You see this very large tumor here with a uh, cross-sectional area here about, 40, uh, about a little over four centimeters. And you can see post-treatment here. Two months later, the size of this tumor having shrunk significantly. Um, as I pointed out, we also have data suggesting perhaps there are a subset of lung cancer patients who might also be, benefit from this combination. And here's data for one of those patients, um, a patient with uh, non-small cell lung cancer who had previously failed two other lines of therapy. And you can see the very large tumor here that um, has shown over 50% reduction in the size of that tumor. And this patient remains on study um, a little more than three months after treatment. So this sort of study, I think, is, is important, not just um, for those people developing, for us developing these agents, but others thinking about trying to try novel combinations of agents in the clinic. Because it shows that you know, clear activity can be seen with combinations of agents that when neither agent alone actually shows much activity. Um, this is really getting about at this idea of oncogene addiction, but perhaps that multiple pathways and hitting multiple nodes may be more effective than hitting any single node. I, I, you know, a strategy that's been talked about a lot um, over the years, but um, this could be one of the first um, times that two agents that alone show no real activity um, as monotherapies, but together show really significant activity. And so discussions are ongoing with regulatory agencies who um, are still getting prepared to see this sort of data and try to understand how best to move it forward to help patients. Um, I think what this does is also provide to um, senior management, to companies like ours, that such data can be very helpful in, in identifying subpopulations of patients that can be tested very early on. Um, and what we've proposed is that it, it can provide this sort of very compelling biological and mechanistic hypotheses that can be tested in vitro and in vivo. Um, given enough evidence, can then be tested very early on in clinical studies in sort of a, a paradigm-shifting way. And so one vision we have for the future about how best to do this is shown here. Um, and it's really, as I've already said, based on the premise that you know, tumors use multiple survival strategies. That's been talked about by Lou, um, by Scott, by others as well. And the idea is if you hit multiple nodes, you can ap apply multiple, uh, you can apply maximal pressure to these tumors and really stop those tumors from growing. Um, we believe that the, some of the new technologies, talked about the sRNA-based um, screening, talked about some of the high-throughput technologies, and I'll talk about that a little more in just a second, are really important for identifying what are the right combinations of agents. So based on this sort of evidence, we've now gone forward and 
um, run enhancer screens, not just for mTOR and IGF-1R, but you know, um, six other, or five other agents that are currently in our portfolio to try and find the optimal combinations of agents that can be used. We've also used it with other standard of care agents that are used in many different cancers. What we're also cognizant of is that there may not be agents for all the targets that we're looking for. And so this may also provide us with opportunities to find novel targets that could be combined with these agents to be able to be more effective in treating cancer patients. But the other thing we'd like to do, and, and using some of the new uh, technologies, including robotics, that are available to us, is to screen for combinations of agents that may be more effective. And one way we'll be doing that is in a project we've called the Polypharmacology Project, which I'll just show briefly in this next slide. So the idea is to be able to look across a panel of different compounds, agents that are in clinical development, novel agents that we haven't taken forward yet, and see about what combination of agents are, would be most effective in treating cancer. So in the past, what we've had to do is just take you know, this, this agent plus this agent and look at the combination. And we've done that for 20 or so different combinations. But with these high throughput technologies now, what you can do is look across a much broader combination of agents. And so with the study we've just completed, I don't have results for today, but 53 different compounds we've now tested in 40 different cell lines allowing over 1,000 different combinations of those um, various agents in 40 different cell lines, um, you know, providing over 2.5 million different um, uh, combinations um, together in those different cell lines. Um, and this can be done with uh, very few people and very quickly. So the, this screen was just run um, a, you know, a little less than two months. And um, again, hopefully uh, invite me back to a future um, symposium and we can present more data on that. But what I can show you is the sort of data that we um, have already received from smaller sorts of screens like this and how it's already having impact on subsequent trials that I don't have clinical data for today. But here's one example of combinations of agents that we've looked at. And in particular, we have an AKT inhibitor and a V1 inhibitor in the clinic today that we're testing. And what we've already noted is combinations with not just agents we have in our portfolio, but that other companies have in their portfolio. So for instance, we are combining our AKT inhibitor with a MEK inhibitor that AstraZeneca has uh, generated based on the sort of um, combination data that we see across preclinical models. And this combination is now in the clinic. Um, data yesterday that was presented in a poster by Amy Gurton at Merck presented on combinations with our we one inhibitors and data we're seeing preclinical. And these sorts of combinations are now being tested clinically. Um, again, based on the evidence that we've already presented on the combination of an IGF-1R plus mTOR inhibitor and the success that we're seeing now in the clinic, we have senior management buy-in to, um, to, to do these sorts of experiments in the, in the clinic. So in conclusion, um, I think it's uh, you know, really safe to say that the um, optimal benefits are going to be seen in, with combinations of therapies. Um, the current st the strategies that existed today were not optimal, taking drug A plus drug B based on somebody's signaling diagram and trying to see whether they'll actually have some activity was probably less than optimal. Um, but that we believe that optimizing these combinations um, using large scale um, techniques and will, will allow us to um, provide better ideas of combinations of agents to be used in the clinic. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge the many people who have been involved in this study. There are a lot more than are shown here, but if I showed them all, they'd be in four font. You wouldn't read any of them. But I want to just highlight a number of people from Merck that are involved in this. Um, Brian Hayes, um, uh, ex-MIT, who uh, leads the mTOR program. Um, Shrivam, who leads the IGF-1R program. Chris Winter, who leads the combination effort. Um, Scott Ebbinghaus, who is a clinician who ran the Phase 1B study, and the many clinicians on the Phase 1 study from Val Debron, Sarah Cannon, and the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. And most importantly, to the cancer patients and the very important role that they play in the development of agents such as this. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>